Hello and welcome to BIOS Roundtable. Today, we are absolutely thrilled to welcome back two great friends of the show in Jeffrey Bluestone and VJ Goodshow. Thank you both once again for joining us. It is an absolute pleasure. Happy to be here. Happy to be here. Wonderful. Let's kick things off. Jeff, can you share a brief introduction with us just to get things started? Yeah. Uh, so as you said, my name is Jeff Bluestone. I'm currently the CEO and co-founder of a cell therapy company called Sonoma Biotherapeutics. Uh, my background over the past four decades has mostly been in academia, uh, where I uh, did a lot of work in my early career and looking at ways to both induce and break immune tolerance and focused on the role of multiple uh, uh, cell populations in that process, most prominently in the last couple of decades, uh, regulatory T cells, what we call T regs, to try to uh, induce and maintain uh, tolerance. And so that's, that's, that's really what my career has been all about. Uh, and I was at uh, initially at the NIH and University of Chicago, and, and most recently at UCSF before uh, starting Sonoma about four years ago. Thank you, Jeff. And Vijay, please, for you as well. Uh, so my name is Vijay Kuchru, and uh, I'm a professor at Harvard Medical School, and I'm also uh, the director of this newly formed Gene Lee Institute of Immunology and Inflammation, and uh, which is an institute of uh, three different uh, institutions within Hutter area, uh, Brigham Women's Hospital, Hutter Medical School, and National Hospital. My lab uh, for the last 20, 25 years has been working on T cells and uh, exploring autoimmunity primarily, and but that has taken us also into cancer. My lab discovered uh, TIM3 and TIM family of genes in 2002, which is a major checkpoint molecule uh, uh, def defining terminal exhaustion in CD8 T cells. And there are multiple clinical trials trying to block uh, TIM3 with PD1. And my lab also was instrumental in defining the IL-17 producing TH17 cells. And these are the T cells that you identify at different places in tissue inflammation and autoimmune diseases and Sjogren's syndrome and psoriasis. And, and in fact, the number one transcripts in MS patients uh, are in fact IL-17 producing T cells. So uh, we have continued uh, working on both autoimmunity and cancer. And uh, ultimate aim is to find ways to, in case of uh, uh, autoimmunity, how to promote tolerance, like what Jeff uh, Jeff said, and uh, whether we can convert these pathogenic TH17 cells to have homeostatic regulatory function. Uh, I was born in India. In fact, I went to Australia to do my training and then uh, PhD from there and came to the United States just for a postdoc. And I thought I'll be here for just a few years and uh, then I'll go back. And obviously that never happened. And I stayed at Harvard Medical School and uh, here I am uh, now a chair professor at Harvard Medical School and have had the good fortune of working a number of people, uh, my collaborators and colleagues at Harvard and elsewhere, including Jeff, I know for the last 20 years. And we're lucky that you stayed. We're lucky to have you both with us today. And in our previous podcast, we've covered both of your storied pasts and what led you to the forefront of the immunology space, uh, taking similar, if slightly different approaches, but as you mentioned, often focusing around T cells, autoimmunity, cancer. And so we're excited to have you back to the show today to discuss and continue in this conversation around the future of immunology. But before we dive in too deep, we'd love to maybe set some immunology context for the audience and ask if you could both briefly introduce uh, why this discussion around the future of immunology is important at this moment in time. What has led to a change in the immunology space for the last couple of years? Vijay, would you like to start? So immunology, in fact, when I first actually started uh, even uh, 20 years ago or 25 years ago, uh, we used to teach students and often they used to ask what has immunology done for uh, medicine or treatment. And uh, we nobody is going to now disagree with us today 
uh, that immunology is probably one of the most important uh, areas of uh, basic biology and medicine. And it is not just a, a, a system that protects you and defends you against infectious organisms, and that's how we got to know it. But it's absolutely critical for maintaining homeostasis, and I think Jeff will talk a little bit more about it. But then also the diseases where we never thought the immunology will have a role, and we keep seeing that they, in the neurodegenerative diseases, you can see that they, in GWAS analysis, number of the transcripts and the genes that have been identified and gen genetically linked to diseases are actually immune genes. And uh, be it the uh, Alzheimer's disease or Parkinson's. And uh, then you have metabolic diseases where inflammation and immunology is playing such an important role. And then uh, you could be even uh, uh, maintaining a, a direct health of the tissue. And some of the work that uh, was done by, at the UCSF showing that the stem like cells are maintained by T Rex. So I think we are now getting into area that it's beyond the development of vaccines, which are important, uh, beyond the development of the tools uh, to protect you against infectious diseases. We're getting into the new decade of immunology is going to be something more than infectious diseases. It is more like how we, in fact, maintain homeostasis, good health, and how it goes uh, awry in uh, many other diseases where we thought immunology has no role. I love that message. And Jeff, would you be uh, able to expand on that a bit? Maybe talk a little bit about the key trends, some maybe breakthroughs that we should be paying attention to as we think about this next decade of immunology and how do we maintain that homeostasis, promote that understanding for good health, as Vijay mentioned. Yeah, sure. I, you know, I, I just building on what Vijay said, I think the, the basics uh, of, of immunology now have been um, uh, applied to almost every disease that we can think of, whether it's obesity or aging or neurodegenerative diseases, as DJ mentioned. And, and they all have a common theme, which is that um, the immune system is basically surveilling um, the body for looking for changes that it can try to quiesce or, or, or modify. And it's when that dysfunction occurs, when that dysregulation occurs, is when many of these diseases uh, exacerbate. And some of the best drugs out there now um, for these diseases are impacting the immune system, like statins for, for heart disease. And so I think it's become clear that this, um, this surveillance system that travels the body, um, it's really all about, um, about keeping, as PJ said, this sort of balancing act of uh, quiescence versus inflammation. Um, so how, how is that going to change the way we develop therapies going forward over the next decade? Well, if we can harness this power of, uh, of immune balance, if we can find ways to basically take situations in, when, in which um, there is in a, an inability to control immunity and set it back uh, to a homeostatic, uh, like a rheostat, you know, I think we'll be able to control many of the of the most uh, damaging diseases that we have out there, not just the autoimmune diseases that we've mentioned, not just um, the the infectious um, settings, even if you think of COVID. The biggest problem with COVID is not the virus infection. It's the dysregulation of the immune system after that infection. So if we can use the immune system to control that, be great. But I think that more importantly, we're going to find an ability to use the immune system to treat these other diseases um, and to, to take um, that inflammation and turn it on its head so that uh, we can basically uh, live better and longer lives. Uh, you can use the immune system as a monitor of, of, of health and aging. If you look at a patient with an autoimmune disease and monitor their, their immune system, they look older then uh, a healthy individual looks uh, at the exact same chronological age. So I think the immune system is going to be a sentinel. It's going to be a therapeutic. It's going to be a way to, to treat a, a, a variety of diseases. And I think, uh, you know, it also allows us all kinds of modalities, small molecules, biologics, cell therapies. These are things that are uniquely uh, approachable with the immune system because 
it's a liquid system. It's a system in which we can both work uh, systemically and we can work locally with tissues. That all makes a lot of sense and honestly gives us a number of paths we can go down. But maybe let's start by pointing a little bit more to your own work, uh, both of you. And so as we think, as we think about that deeper understanding of the immune system and how it's accelerated the landscape, as you said, to approach a multitude of diseases, uh, thinking a little bit more specifically around the science of T cells, which has resulted in so many transformative therapies and really just a breakthrough in understanding to continue level setting this conversation uh, for the audience. We'd love to ask you about your own work and maybe Jeff, you can start this time and share a little bit of uh, the context in which as you mentioned earlier, you're studying T cells and T regs, immune tolerance, and highlight how uh, Sonoma has really extended your work in the space. Yeah, great. Sure. I'm happy to do that. So, um, as I said, I've been around this business for, for multiple decades. And the way I got sort of focused on T cells was a, um, a study that I started when I was at the NIH trying to make uh, monoclonal antibodies against the T cell receptor. Um, we failed. Uh, to make the antibodies against the receptor itself, but made an antibody against one of the components of the T cell receptor, the so-called CD3 molecule. Um, and, um, and, and that antibody um, had been tested in humans and approved by the FDA for the treatment of organ transplant rejection. So we started studying the antibody that we had made in the mouse and really learned how important T cells were at that point, not just because you were able to modify organ graft rejection, but you could modify autoimmune diseases. You could reverse autoimmune diseases with the antibody. The antibody is ultimately, um, and most recently, some 35 years later, been approved by the FDA for the treatment of uh, type 1 diabetes, um, actually before you actually have clinical disease. And what we learned over that time is that one of the major targets, uh, or one of the major um, mechanisms of action for the CD3 antibody was to alter that balance. You would both deplete effector cells, which were responsible for inducing disease, but you would also promote this other population of T cells called regulatory T cells. And based on um, when BJ was talking about how the field has changed, but based on a transformational set of studies that were done um, starting in the 90s, which is to understand key transcription factors that controlled these different T cell subsets, which BJ is right at the center of a lot of that work. Um, there were uh, three investigators that identified a transcription factor, FOXB3, which controlled these regulatory T cells. And once we had that in hand, not only did we understand how drugs like anti CD3 antibodies or um, CTLA4 IG or others drugs works, but it allowed us to get a handle on these cells and not just follow them and understand them and try to um, improve them but actually isolate them and grow them up. And so starting in the mid 2000s, we started coming up with technologies that allowed us to not just isolate these cells, but to expand them and put them back into the patient. And that work was done at UCSF. We showed the cells were safe. We showed that they got to their target, um, but it was the advent of gene engineering technology that really changed the landscape and allowed us not just to work with these cells as uh, non-specific tools, but to really engineer them so that they could be directed at the sites of disease and inflammation. And uh, based on that uh, set of technologies, we started the company Sonoma Biotherapeutics, which was to take these Treg therapeutics, uh, but now introduce specificity to increase their uh, activity uh, in the lesion. Uh, and so our first indication is rheumatoid arthritis. And we developed uh, what we call a CAR T-Reg um, that recognizes a protein in the joints of patients with RA and, uh, and, and are starting a clinical trial as we speak to really test to see um, whether we can modify uh, the disease progression with these engineered cells. There are follow-on studies by us and other companies using both T cell receptor generate, uh, engineered and CAR engineered Tregs to treat everything from uh, rheumatoid arthritis, type one diabetes, uh, inflammatory bowel disease, organ transplant. And so we'll know in the next couple of years, whether this notion of a new type of therapy, a cell therapy, a living drug, whether that will be able to permanently and durably shut down immune responses such that your um, you're not at an imbalance and your, your immune system is intact. 
one last point about it because of all the things you said already. One can imagine these cells also being used in diseases um, where there's not an autoimmune or direct immune responsibility, but inflammation. It's being tested in diseases like ALS, being tested in diseases um, where the inflammation is out of control, like even like a stroke or or ORDS, this uh, these respiratory uh, infectious disease induced dysfunction. So I think this whole cell therapy space is really going to explode and and potentially you know be uh, lifelong treatments for these diseases. Thank you, Jeff and Vijay. Would you love? Uh, we'd love for you to expand on that if possible. I know. You talked about IL-17 and its roles in inflammation and various indications earlier, just as Jeff was mentioning in your work with CD and T cells. We'd love to hear your thoughts around how these cells are able to impact everything from autoimmune to neuroimmunology, as you started to share earlier. So the, uh, the lab, in fact, uh, my lab started early on and uh, to study why uh, in autoimmune diseases, uh, the tolerance breaks down and your cell reactive immune cells are targeting the target tissue and inducing tissue inflammation. And uh, I was fascinated by a series of experiments that were done before I was even in the field is that the, you can have an autoreactive T cell, you can expand them in the culture dish and you can transfer them and they will induce uh, disease with exquisite specificity. And that led me to the field of studying autoimmune T cells. And, uh, and we wanted to know how are these autoreactive T cells generated, but how are they even shut down? And uh, doing a series of experiments, uh, in fact, we generated something like 20,000 monoclonal antibodies against Th1 cells, which were thought to be autoreactive at the time, disease-inducing T cells, and identified two antibodies out of 20,000 monoclonal antibodies that identified this molecule called TIM3. And the molecule uh, then also allowed us to identify the whole family of genes. And uh, it has uh, been uh, shown to be expressed on effector T cell is an inhibitory molecule. And if you get rid of it, uh, you can see the effector T cells uh, uh, hyperactivate and they induce tissue inflammation. They activate myeloid cells. And it's also expressed on regulatory T cells that Jeff talked about. And I think the, it got a new lease of life when uh, Anna Anderson working in the lab uh, identified that it was expressed on exhausted CD8 T cells uh, in cancer. And that's why it's targeted right now is there multiple clinical trials. I think about last I counted was about 12 or 13 clinical trials on using anti-TIM3 antibody uh, in uh, various forms of cancer from acute myeloid leukemia, where it's heavily expressed on the, uh, the leukemic cells uh, to, to uh, non-small cell lung carcinoma with PD-1. So that was one aspect of the work. And the second one was that the, uh, we soon realized as uh, a series of experiments showed that if you deleted infant gamma, uh, which is expressed by Th1 cells, the autoimmune diseases got worse, not better. We had expected them to get better. So uh, everybody started thinking to themselves, saying that if it's not an infant gamma producing Th1 cell that's inducing autoimmunity, what is it? And so there was this, I think five or six groups started looking at what is infiltrating an autoimmune tissue. And a number of labs identified these IL-17 producing uh, T cells, they look like they're related to Th1 cells. In fact, uh, 2005, we wrote a, a report saying that uh, they may be related to Th1 cells, but the, the distinct class of T cells uh, that produce IL-17 and uh, identified the differentiating factors for it, and which was also very interesting that the Tj beta uh, it can induce these Tregs that are FOXP3 positive that Jeff talked about, and when they are sensing Tj beta with other pro-inflammatory cytokines like IL-6 or IL-21, and this was the moment, an aha moment, where we found that these two cytokines together will inhibit the induction of regulatory T cells, inhibit the ability of these Tregs to suppress inflammation, but 
induce these highly proliferant TH17 cells uh, that are uh, disease-inducing. And you can see these cells to be present in multiple human and mouse autoimmune diseases. And uh, that actually revolutionized the concept of uh, differentiation, T-cell differentiation. So my lab spent quite a bit of time defining differentiating factors for multiple other subsets of T-cells. But coming to the last topic is the neuroimmunology or neuroimmune interactions. It's an interesting story, and I'm going to actually tell, tell it briefly, is that the, my son, when he was born uh, 30 years ago, is that the, he w turned out to be severely allergic. This was a time when uh, there were no peanut-free zones uh, in the kindergarten or preschool, and the airlines still gave you peanuts. And he was allergic to almost everything you could, you could think of. So that turned out to be a, very, a, a challenge for us as a family. And, uh, but what was worse is that uh, there were situations where when if he got an allergic, food allergic bout, and we can control the blood pressure and we can control uh, by EpiPens and antihistamines, but if he started vomiting, he would not stop vomiting. And he, so much so, that we had to take him to the children's hospital and there they had to sedate him in order to stop vomiting. And this gave me an idea that there must be this intimate relationship during an immune reaction, and in this case, type 2 reaction, that there must be an intimate relationship between uh, uh, Im immune cells and the neurons that they activate, and the neurons in turn may be activating the immune cells. And this led to the discovery, I think, uh, five, six years ago, that the neuropeptide receptors on immune cells, and they have profound effect in amplifying the type 2 immunity. And now we are finding the other way around that they have cytokine receptors on the enteric neurons and why they are playing a very important role in promoting allergic reactions. So it's uh, really an interesting field now that the immunology is connecting with other fields where it has profound effect. Because if you look at the, you talk to neuroscientists, they only think of the action potential. They don't think about the cytokines as a trigger for activating a neuron. And kind of neuropeptides we are seeing that are induced by cytokine activation of neurons is uh, the whole array of new things that it's a whole new world out there and that immune immunologists and immune system activates. And I think it's, it's going to be a whole new set series of discoveries that are going to be made when we look at these two fields actually joining together. I have to strongly agree with that, Vijay. And I think is exactly as you described, immunology is becoming increasingly interdisciplinary and involving not only the biology, but also computational sciences, ecology, and more. And as we think about this uh, cross-disciplinary approach and these collaborations that are driving innovation in the field, we'd love to ask both of your thoughts on how uh, technological advances might transform our understanding of immune responses, disease mechanisms, uh, the development of targeted therapies, are we looking at multi-omic studies, the impacts of single-cell RNA sequencing? What are the sort of innovations you're seeing that are driving this uh, increase and enhanced understanding today? Do you want to give it a start, Jeff? Uh, I'll just start, and I'm, PJ, I'm sure I'll expand on it well. I, I, I will say that um, there are very few technologies that have been developed that are in um, of use in the immune uh, arm armatorium right now. And I think one of the biggest... Um, always one of the biggest advantages of studying the immune system is that it's liquid. And, you know, and with the ability to get biopsies from tissues uh, combined with the circulating cells, I think there's tremendous opportunity, whether it be um, as ways of biomarker development. I mean, we can now sample the immune system in the blood and, and really monitor all kinds of uh, disease. It's like a dog that can smell cancer. Um, the immune system can go and detect things that are happening elsewhere in the body because it's a sentinel. So I see that there'll be tremendous opportunities in diagnostic fields by looking at immune cells and, and, and their fingerprint. I think there's um, the interface between uh, the tissue and the immune system that's being studied now. And VJ's done beautiful work in single cell analysis and things like the gut. 
that allows us to understand the interplay of subsets. You know, what we've been talking about for the last half hour or so really is this yin yang, right? And understanding what are the signals in the body that turn cells on and off? What are the signals on the cell that turn cells on and off? What are the signals in different tissues that turn cells on and off? And the technology and tools that are available today are going to be extraordinary. I think the future is going to be, how do we take all this data? And there is tons of data. You can, you know, it's easy to do the experiment. Then how do you turn that data into knowledge? How do we take a combination of, you know, for fairly straightforward machine learning and now with some neural networking and AI to really try to understand the complexity of these um these nodes of information that are being delivered back and forth. And I think that there, um, the new technologies that are being developed to really understand the networks are going to be critical in being able to uh, elucidate what are the, the rules, because we don't know all the rules yet, and that's going to be critical. So uh, just expanding on what uh, Jeff said, actually, he's, he's very well said, uh, giving a perspective of... Uh, how the technologies are going to, is changing our field, uh, but how it's also can be used to the benefit of driving knowledge rather than just generating data and how the systems may be coming up together and communicating with each other. And, and as Jeff rightly put it, that the immune system is very liquid. It can go in all different places it can impact the tissue and tissue in return can impact the immune system. And it couldn't be done without the technologies that we have at hand today. And I remember 10 years ago, and we were trying to generate these differentiate T cells into TH17 cells. And uh, I had a very simple question saying that if you're starting with a naive cell, how does it become a TH17 cell and not a TH1 cell or a TH2 cell? And I approached uh, Aviv Regev, who was at the Broad Institute at the time. And it started as such a wonderful collaboration that they, they had to write new algorithms. And we had to generate a whole series of snapshots of data as T cell was differentiating. And identified targets that we had never seen before. And uh, one of the uh, targets that we came up with was this uh, SGK1, which is a salt sensing kinase. And in fact, that now there are these epidemiological studies showing, in fact, patients that take high salt diet uh, are more susceptible to developing autoimmunity and its effect on TH17 differentiation. I mean, going a step further, and then how the single cell RNA C, uh, which was uh, where Avi uh, Rega was instrumental in developing the technology, and then the software uh, algorithms to analyze the data sets is also very important to how to decode the data and converting this all this information into knowledge and looking at the interactions. Uh, but I, what I'm even more excited about is this, how we can, in fact, identify a, a, a target and this linear sequence can be put into an algorithm that will give you a three-dimensional structure. And uh, this three-dimensional structure will show you exactly the pockets uh, which are interacting pockets or pockets that can be uh, pockets for small molecules or the faces where the ligands can bind. And uh, then you have this whole new discovery of these uh, chemical substances uh, that they are available and they will show, it will show you is that what particular chemical substance may fit in those pockets and interfere uh, with, the, with the function. So, Appropriately used, uh, I think we will have a lot of information uh, that is out there. And if appropriately analyzed, we may have a whole new, of inf new information. Without having to do a single experiment, we will have hypothesis. We can actually begin to test what this target may be able to do, what chemical compounds may be able to bind, and if it may have the interaction with X, Y, and Z ligand. And that's what I'm excited about. I think the new uh, field of immunology will have so much to offer using these cell therapies. Uh, they're going into the target tissues, 
how do they change in the target? Because we already know many cells, when they go to target, they will change. And how does it change a target? And is there a way to see that a fingerprint, as Jeff says, that will give you an idea this cell has been to brain and has come back and done X, Y, Z there. So these are all the things that I think I'm seeing will come in the future. And I think it's bright. And uh, Jeff rightly put it, there's going to be a lot of data. We need enough computational support to convert that data into knowledge that's actionable knowledge. And I, I think it would be, we, we shouldn't leave the therapeutic opportunity on the sideline either. I mean, it's tremendous yeah, biology no. we've got to learn and we've got and we do that. But think about what we're going to be able to do with this liquid system. We're going to be able to arm um, cells either ex vivo and put them back in the patients or in vivo with gene therapy. We're going to be able to get them to go to the sites that we want them to go to. They're going to be able to deliver payloads that might repair tissue more effectively or deliver signals, as DJ pointed out, in those sites so that neurons or whatever uh, tissue receptors. So we have an ability now with these new technologies, I think, to and combine with the fact that the immune system is really smart gets to places it needs to go. It's got the ability to um, to carry warheads and 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 regulatory peace peacemakers as well. Um, that I think that the next decade is going to see not just a explosion of understanding of the of the the power of how the immune system works and how T cells work, the subsets and interact, and, but how to now deliver um, the these. Uh, these therapeutics to patients in ways that we can't even um, imagine right now. As we think a little bit more about delivering to patients, and you both started to touch on this already, but just to, uh, I guess, drive the point home. The shift today, and this started a little bit more in the oncology space, partly driven by immunotherapy, uh, is more towards increasingly precision medicine which aims to personalize healthcare based on individuals, genomic, transcriptomic, proteomic, just broadly omics data, but also individual uh, disease states. And so as we think about its application, just as you're describing to monitoring the immune cells and their transport through the, and their travel through the body and how they might be interacting with different tissue types, with different pathophysiological conditions, how do we think about this concept of precision medicine being applied to immunology? And what are maybe some of the potential benefits as we think about immune-related conditions, especially given the individuality of uh, patients' individual uh, response and treatment needs? Are there cases where precision medicine has really been showing that promise and immunological interventions today? Just let me give you one, one, one example that we've been working on recently. So we started studying a disease called hydrodentitis superativa, which is a terrible skin disease, causes incredible um, discomfort, pain, abscesses, and stuff. And, and it's been studied now for a while. And um, one of the drugs that got approved was uh, uh, Humira, which is an anti-TNF antibody, which is representative of a typical TH1 response. And everybody thought that. But then most recently, there's been very successful therapy with an anti-IL-17 uh, antibody and, and what BJ has been talking about. And so he already pointed out that in some of his early studies, when he knocked out interferon gamma, T17 cells went up. And so how do those two cells play with each other? Are we talking about different patients for you here, really? Some patients that have a TH1 phenotype and are driven by a certain set of microbes because it's very much a, a my, you know, all mucosal services interact with the we haven't even talked about microbes, which is a big player in this whole thing, but all, all mucosal services interact with their microbiome. Um, and so is that driving the difference? Can we look at patients that are TH1 type HS versus TH17? And that's just an example. And it's true of so many diseases now that, um, that we need to start understanding the subsets within these diseases and how we can craft. You're not going to want to give an anti-IL-17 antibody to a TH1 um, driven disease patient necessarily, right? So I, that's just an example. And, and BJ can probably list 10 more where understanding the patient and understanding, by the way, it can be the state of the disease. 
It could be the individual patient, it might even be different lesions in the same patient. As we start to understand that, we'll be able to treat people uh, in, as you say, in this kind of precision medicine um, approach uh, that, that I hope, you know, is going to make every disease into an orphan disease because we'll know which subset and slice of each patient to treat with, with, with which therapy. Let me elaborate a little bit more, actually. Uh, Jeff, very well put. Uh, because I I remember a time when, uh, you see, uh, anti-TNFs came into being and they were doing a good job in uh, uh, rheumatoid arthritis. Then they were tested in psoriasis. They did something in psoriasis. Then they were tested in IBD. They did something in IBD. And then came along... Uh, TH17, discovery of TH17 cells, IL-17. And uh, we started subclassing these uh, tissues and diseases. And uh, then anti-IL-17 antibody as uh, it came along. And you put it in psoriasis patients within six weeks, you get PASI 90 score. That means 90% lesions are gone within six weeks. And the IL-23, another player of TH17 differentiation. And you can see that anti-TNF did something. It wasn't spectacular, but it is, again, seeing the matching the disease to the intervention. We know that in psoriasis, there is a massive amount of IL-17 and TH17 cells in the lesion both the T cells, uh, alpha beta T cells, gamma beta T cells uh, make it. And you give anti-IL-17 and you are now matching the disease uh, to the causative, age, causative cytokine. And I think something very really similar is going to happen in the uh, cancer immunotherapy. Uh, right now we're giving anti ctl 4 and anti-PD-1 to everybody and everything, every tumor that comes along. But with more precision, we may in fact begin to nuance it. He's saying that if it's a gut-induced tumor versus skin-induced tumor versus lung-induced tumor, the microenvironment is different, as Jeff pointed out. And there is uh, there may be a totally different set of players. Like I gave example of psoriasis. There are totally different set of players that are playing a role in the tissue of the skin tumor tissue in the skin versus the lung versus the gut. And once we have the appropriate intervention for the agent, for the target, I think we will see spectacular responses and efficacy of these agents. And that means you are matching the color uh, with the right indication and you will see increased efficacy. And I think, Jeff, I have never seen, heard this before, that, but I think it's a very well put that we will have all these diseases broken down into little orphan diseases where we will match the right target with the right agent. And it may work perfectly well, 90% response and only about 20% of patients. But that would be spectacular because we will then know classes of patients and what interventions to give. All makes a lot of sense. And I want to double click on something there that you talked about, VJ, uh, and Jeff, of course, in regards to the microbiome, particularly in the gut and the skin, that's gained a lot of attention recently for its role in modulating immune response. Would love to get your thoughts here as experts in the field on how our understanding of the microbiome and its interactions with the immune system might shape and influence uh, future clinical applications. So I will, I'll give you a couple of examples. So my lab doesn't stay, uh, study the microbiome per se, but uh, uh, some of the observations that we made was were very, very interesting. And uh, we had a paper in Cell a couple of years ago. And obviously we study autoimmunity. And what we found was every time you start an autoimmune reaction, the T cells are generated. We can identify the T cell receptors. We can identify these autoreactive T cells with tetramers. We know their engine specific. We know their cytokine profile. So when you immunize a mouse for inducing an autoimmunity, you have these uh, T cells that are generated. They will go to the target and induce autoimmune inflammation, which makes perfect sense and which is what we have been teaching in the classes all the time. And we have always been working that how to, how to modify those T cells. But 
What we also was surprised was that the, we found a bunch of and a cluster of cells that are autoreactive, induced by autoimmune uh, uh, autoantigen, they land up in your gut. And these are stem-like cells. They form the reservoirs for the future attack, and they are maintained there by gut microbiota. And if the gut microbiota changes, and these T cells change, and if you delete the microbiota, this these autoreactive T cells that went from lymph node and form the reservoir in the gut also vanish. And we think that these cells are forming a reservoir for the future attacks in autoimmunity, for the future of immunotherapy, for the cancer immunology, and future of vaccines in case of you are immunizing somebody with a vaccine. So I think the gut and lung and skin are playing a very important role and the microbiome, each of these places is different. But what we are doing is that every time there is an infection or inflammation or injury, we are generating these immune cells and you have these immune cells mediating an Im immediate attack or recovery from inflammation if the TH2 cell, but the, you're also generating a reservoir of cells that stay with you for lifelong and they go to the my they go to the to the mucosal surfaces where they are forming these reservoirs for the future use for good or for bad. So I think the microbiota uh, is playing a very important and essential role for maintaining these reservoirs. And it makes sense when patients come with an autoimmune attack, they often will tell you the anecdotal saying that, oh, doc, I actually had a very severe cold. I couldn't shake it off. Or I had this, this diarrhea, which actually was unrelenting. And you see, there are these dysbiosis maybe playing a role in con converting these homeostatic cells that are sitting in the gut or in the lung to become pathogenic. So I'm just giving you one example of it. Yeah, and I'll, I'll double down on that. In, in diabetes, for instance, uh, we showed a few years ago that uh, if you take the microbiome out of the animal, they don't get diabetes anymore. We know the microbiome is not living in the pancreas, right? So, so that connectivity of about half of your T cells, your regulatory T cells in the body live in the gut. And they're constantly sampling the microbiota. They respond to the microbiota. They respond to metabolites that are coming from the microbiota. Biota, and depending on the class of microbes, it can be a positive or a negative impact. And so I, I agree with VJ. Not only is it a reservoir, but it's also a generator of a lot of the cells that go to other sites to actually mediate, in this case, regulation. And so I think um, it's hard to know how to think about the, mi the microbiome. Is it, is it really self? You know, because it really is commensal. You're living with these microbiomes. So in a lot of ways, it's it's self. Um, or is it foreign when they become pathogenic, when they cause diarrhea and things like that? And I think, again, it's another set of regulations, another set of on and off switches um, that we have to understand because if we can tap into the microbiome as even therapeutics. Uh, there are companies now that are engineering bacteria to express antigens that when delivered um, in those bacteria can modify immune responses. So you can imagine a uh, paper in 2011, uh, we being Michael Fischbach and Wendell Lim and I on how um, cell therapy uh, in the future could well turn out to be bacteria that are the cells that we treat because they can express the proteins that we want to regulate. So I think the microbiome is gonna continue to be a powerful, both a powerful technology and tool but also a powerful set of therapeutics. And, and obviously the more we can understand about the interface between um, that, that world and the human uh, body world, I think the better we're gonna be able to tap into. I wish we had another hour to just dive really deep into this topic and a number of others, but pivoting slightly, as we start to come to a close, we'd love to get your opinions on a few areas through a, just a quick rapid fire. So as translational researchers, 
who have so successfully uh, brought academic research to clinical practice. How do you think about, uh, and do you have any insights or recommendations to think about the process of translating research into practical treatments for patients, given that it often faces such a valley of death between promising laboratory discoveries and really successful clinical interventions? Jeff, do you want to kick things off? Sure. Um, it's, I always, I have, a, I have a, a concept that I always talk about. You need three things. You need kick-ass science. That's the first thing. If you're not doing great science, the rest of it falls apart. Then you need to collaborate like hell. I mean, my, what success I've had in my career is largely due to the collaborators that I've been able to interact with, the networks that I've been able to create. The best way to get across the divide is to collaborate across the divide, whether it's clinicians collaborating with PhDs on a PhD, whether it's industry collaborating with academia, whether it's the government interfacing with both. So I'd say collaborate like hell. And then the third, which I know it sounds mom and apple pie, but you know, make a difference. It, it could be in your mentorship. It could be in pushing an envelope. The NACD3 took 35 years. I mean, these are not simple problems. And I think the best way to translate medicine is to be committed to it and to do whatever it's going to take to make sure we get into patients. And all of that depends on every part of the ecosystem from the basic scientists, the clinicians, the regulators, the patients, and the more we can build, build rapport and ties, and I know I'm supposed to be short and sweet, the better we're going to be in this setting. Uh, I couldn't agree more. In fact, the basis for all of this is the good science, picking a problem that uh, is important, identify your collaborators, work and be so loyal to them. And that's one builds a trust and reach out to see whether there is anybody who is going to trust it, your idea into therapy so that you can benefit mankind. I uh, absolutely so, love that. Oh, sorry, Vijay. Yeah, so that's, that, that's my short and sweet answer. Absolutely love that message of collaboration and would maybe love to close things out with an open-ended question, which is what are the most open questions in immunology today? Vijay, I'll come to you first. Step. I think that I am finding uh, this immune system going into tissues and changing itself and changing the tissue, what are those cues uh, that make them work better or worse? That's going to be a whole new world, whole new world that we haven't gone into yet. Uh, I am really excited about the interactions between different systems that uh, it's not silos like what we have been teaching immunology, working with different systems, whether it's the neurons or whether it is the metabolic angle, uh, even the, using the computational people to help us analyze it, all are actually very good. And I think that's where immunology is going to go. And I'm very excited about it. I'm going to give a disappointing answer. Uh, in 1989, I went to a Cold Spring Harbor meeting and uh, one of the well-known immunologists at the time got up in front of that group. And it was right after the T cell receptor was cloned and, and we had a, <laughs> an, an MHC restriction and said, you know, all we have to do is dot a few I's and cross a few T's and we have this whole immune system figured out. And of That's course, the... you know, here we are, uh, you know, 25 years later and the number of new ideas and new things. So. To me, I'm not a crystal ball guy. I've never been able to predict where the next um, disruptive opportunity is going to come from. Um, but I tell you that I think that the future will be extraordinarily exciting because it always is. Um, in many ways, we're just at the end of the beginning here. And I think that we just have to make sure we don't get hung up in our own dogma. We don't get um, convinced of our own uh, our own smarts. and if we're, and that's why graduate students are so great, if we're willing to be open to it. I mean, the things VJ talked about today, 10 years ago, nobody would say that the cross, the cross communication between a neuron and a T cell would be instrumental in determining the, uh, the outcome of, a, of, an, of an allergic response, right? So 
I am um, not going to answer your question with some kind of pretty high level um, predictive thing, but I'll tell you, it's good. There's going to be disruptive science. There always is. And it's being open to it and it's being willing to take chances and, uh, and, and fail many times. That's the other part of what we do. We fail a lot. It's, it's going to be whatever it's going to be. In fact, I completely agree that, and share the enthusiasm that Jeff has, that uh, we are at the end of a beginning and the, what we have just generated, just the tools, and we are going to use these tools to do something which will be fantastic. And this is going to be a whole new immunology that's going to be written. We are not done. We're just starting. <laughs> I can't think of a better note to end on. And as we think about that uh, start and that next start, how can our audience learn more about your work? Are there any anything else you'd like to share? Any closing thoughts, shameless plugs? Floor is over. You know, yeah, yeah people can find us. Um, we Unfortunately, we live in a very transparent world right now, which is good in many ways. In many ways, it can be challenging. So, you know, anybody can find what we're doing. Uh, and certainly, um, I, I, I think it's anyone in the audience who wants to delve into this space is going to get excited and challenged and hopefully rewarded by, by spending the time looking into it. Yeah. Uh, we have a lab website uh, and the Gene Lee Institute also has a, a website coming up, which will have all the information that we are doing. And as Jeff said, it's an open world. They can find us and what we are doing with publications and our website where everything is uh, published. I'm looking forward to continuing following. And just as you said, I'm absolutely excited by the conversation today. So thank you, Jeff and BJ, for an absolutely fantastic episode. We're very grateful for your time. Thank you again. Thank you very much. Thank you for having us. Bye-bye. Take care.